Have you ever thought about a career in the whiskey industry? I'm not talking about being the next master distiller, but if you want a leg up on the competition, you need to take a look at the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. This six-course program will prepare you for the business side of the spirits industry, like finance, marketing, and operations. This is 100% online, meaning that you can access the classes at any time and anywhere. So what are you waiting for? All that's required is a bachelor's degree. Go to uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. So if you think back in the 1980s, it was a bleak period for bourbon. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Golly. Everybody's, everybody's just popping bottles. They don't even give a shit what's going on around here. I'm listening, really. I thought it was a good timing. This is episode 245 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny. We've got a lot of news to cover, so let's hit it. COVID-19 or the coronavirus is hitting everyone extremely hard. Now, I'm not sure why people are stocking up on toilet paper like they don't plan on leaving the bathroom anytime soon, but I'm sure most of us have enough bourbon to get us through this time. At this point, every major distillery has shut down tours. So if you had plans to visit the bourbon trail, please make sure you do your research before coming to see what is and what is not open. Likely, it's going to be nothing because even at this time, all bars and restaurants in the city of Louisville are amid of a shutdown of in-person patrons. And in more coronavirus news, we've talked about this before about one of the benefits of having a state-run liquor is that the product is always sold at SRP. Well, who could have predicted this, but Pennsylvania, one of those states where all spirits are government sanctioned and controlled, have closed all liquor stores in the state indefinitely on Tuesday this past week. This also includes all online orders. So that means the entire state of Pennsylvania has literally zero access to bourbon. I guess after all this time, we called them bourbon bunkers for a reason. In a shocking vote, a bill has passed by the House Licensing and Occupations Committee that allows Kentucky residents to get alcohol shipped to their door. But get this, directly from the producer, and wait for it, without going through a distributor or retailer. This is a huge modernization and reform that could lead to a larger domino effect across the nation. Now, this bill would require alcohol shipments to be very clearly labeled and an ID check and signature upon delivery the producer would still have to pay the excise tax on all inbound shipments coming to Kentucky. However, retailers testified in front of the committee to express concerns about how the bill would negatively impact their businesses because people would be able to order alcohol from their homes and have it shipped to their door instead of going to the local retailer. In my head, I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's kind of the whole point, right? However, that didn't matter, and now this amended House Bill 415 is going to the full house. We're going to keep you updated as this progresses. Is there a barrel shortage on the horizon? Well, Lou Bryson over at the Daily Beast wrote an article where he interviews everyone from Coopers to loggers and millers themselves. The loggers fear a shortage of white oak, while the Coopers really don't. Wood scientists see wetter conditions now than they have in previous years, and the increased deer populations actually eating acorns, which means less trees, And at this time, there's no plan to actually manage oak populations, so it could lead to more maple and fewer white oaks. However, independent stave company says that they are coming off two rainy years where prices for logs were high, but now they see plenty of oak across 20 different states. Brown Foreman Cooperage says that they see more white oak now than they have in the past 40 years, and the industry is doing better sustainability by harvesting oak at the right time to allow newer growth to form. Lou sums up the post talking about the Cooperages, only using about 2% of the hardwood industry, but he reflected upon his time spent with the logger, and he said that there is a lot of oak out there, but it's actually impossible to mill it because there's no mills around and it's hard to get it out of the forest as well. So bourbon is going to continue to be produced, but we're going to have to see what the future entails for the barrels themselves. You can read this story over the Daily Beast with the link in our show notes. Can bourbon be made in U.S. territories like Puerto Rico and Guam? Well, Josh Peters over at the Whiskey Jug took this question to the TTB Regulations Division to see if it actually still would be legally called bourbon. Sure enough, they confirmed it that bourbon whiskey can be produced in Puerto Rico and Guam with reference to 27 CFR 5.11, 
where the USA is defined as the United States, the several states and territories and the District of Columbia. And the term state includes a territory and the District of Columbia. And the term territory means the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. So there you have it. Booker's Bourbon Batch 2020-1, also known as Granny's Batch, will be released at 63.2% ABV or 126.4 proof. It is named after the sixth generation master distiller Booker Knows mom, Margaret Beam Knows. Although she never worked in the bourbon business herself, she certainly played an important role in keeping the bourbon family tradition alive, carrying the legacy on from the fifth to the sixth generation. She was very close with her oldest son, Booker, who was instrumental in getting him his first job at the distillery, where he would eventually go to become the master distiller. This bourbon is to be released at six years, four months, and 21 days in age, and will be available sometime around this month for around $90. Four Roses is setting aside six barrels to be chosen for and exclusively sold to the Four Roses Mellow Moments members. Mellow Moments is a special club organized by Four Roses that allows members of the general public to be a part of special gatherings, tastings, and you can stay up to date on Four Roses news, plus get some cool trinkets set in the mail every once in a while. New members can apply at select times during the year when the window opens. And the window to join when that membership does open is only for a handful of minutes, so you better act quick. You can see their website for more details at mellowmomentsclub.com. Now in some Pursuit Series news, episodes 22 and 23 are now available on sealbox.com. So if you're looking to get some killer bourbon shipped to your door during this time, head on over there and get stocked up. Episode 23, I'm super excited about because it's our oldest release ever at 15 years old. Now, in today's show, we talk about two things that are top of mind. First, it's that coronavirus. We had to talk about it, but we decided to change topics up a little bit because you've been hearing all about it on the news, so we got to kind of break away from it. And what other bourbon is out there that can be just as argumentative? It's got to be Blanton's. So we take the whole entire episode and talk about it. We take a look at the hype and the hysteria that surrounds it. We dive into the recent news of Blanton's gold making its way to the U.S. And it, do we think if a $120 SRP is a deal that you should be jumping on? You're also going to hear a new voice for a few minutes when we start this, and that's Aaron Goldfarb. Now, you may have seen his work on various publications around the web, but due to some technical difficulties, he wasn't able to stay on for the entire podcast, but we hope to have him on again once in the future. All right. It's showtime. Here's Joe from Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. And remember, go wash your hands. Hey everyone, Joe here again. I know I talk a lot about blending here, but we also have a national single barrel program. Ask your local retailer or bourbon club about selecting your own private barrel. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Death and taxes. Those are the two things that we are guaranteed in life to have to do. Taxes, April 15th comes around and every year I'm like, son of a beep, beep, beep. How did I not remember to put all this together? And every year from a business perspective, I tell myself I'm going to do a better job of keeping my books. And I never do. I never do. I just focus on what I do. And then toward the end of the year, I rush and do all my books. And well, I'm a procrastinator, if you will, when it comes to the accounting side of my world. I need to get better at it. I will. But you know what? At least I don't have to pay 60 to 80% of taxes on everything that I do. And that, my friends, is what Kentucky distillers have to pay. About 60% of every bottle of bourbon that you buy, if you tally up all of it, 60% of that goes to taxes. What's interesting about this is that Kentucky bourbon gets taxed uh, six six different times off the still, in the barrel, in the case, in the bottle, and then the consumers pay a uh, sales tax. And in Kentucky, they have to pay a wholesale tax as well. So you have all these different taxes that they have to pay that leads to leads to basically more, more, and more money that has to go to the government just for them to produce whiskey. Now here's what's messed, really, really messed up, is that the distillers don't mind paying the taxes necessarily. 
they actually look at it as like, hey, you know what? This is not necessarily a bad thing. All that money, a lot of that money gets earmarked to go to roads and schools of Kentucky. So like in Anderson County, you drive through there and you see the nice roads and schools. Those were basically built by Wild Turkey and Four Roses, which puts a lot of money into that government infrastructure. Also, Kentucky bourbon, the taxes are specifically earmarked for education. I think a couple of years ago when, um, when things started you know, riling up with the teachers here, it became public that bourbon pumped $30 million into the education system. So I've always said, like, if you want to, if you want to improve the Kentucky education system, buy more Kentucky bourbon. In fact, when you buy Kentucky bourbon, no matter where you are, you are actually helping the roads, the schools, the children, the teachers, you're helping our entire state. So thank you, because we have pretty nice roads out in the rural areas because people buy a lot of bourbon. But here's another fun fact. It wasn't until 2011 that the distillers were even allowed to write off their the fact that they were paying these taxes. They would have to wait to until they bottled it and put it in the market before they could write off the expense of the, the ad valorem tax that they were facing. So American whiskey has all these weird, awkward tax laws that every time I start complaining about having to do taxes or do my books, I kind of look at myself in the mirror and say, well, at least I'm not a distiller. So remember that this year, as you're going to put your taxes together, however you do it, at least you're not having to do 60 to 80% of the taxes and you get to write everything off when it's time to write it off. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Fred here tonight. People's Champ isn't able to make it because of coronavirus things that are happening. So we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, we'll send our best wishes to Ryan. He doesn't have the coronavirus. So I don't want to make, 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 that, make that clear. Uh, the way I said that probably sounded like really dire. Uh, no, he's actually trying to do some things for his uh, for his job and set up daycare because we've got a lot of things happening where schools can be shut down for the next few weeks here in Kentucky. So he's got to make sure that he's taking care of his employees tonight. So uh, we're going to miss Ryan tonight, but we will go on without him. So uh, before we kind of introduce everybody here, I kind of want to talk to Fred. Are you uh, are you doomsday prepared? You got you got enough bourbon and toilet paper to get you through for the next month? Uh, well, you know, like today was, you know, I wasn't supposed to be on today because I was supposed to be in San Francisco for the competition. But, uh, last minute, uh, you know, we had to scare ourselves and my wife, she's the, on the, the committee for like, uh, getting the Louisville VA hospital, uh, prepared for the coronavirus. So, uh, we've been getting prepared, I think for the last three months. In fact, we, we thought there was a tornado coming, you know, there might be a tornado coming. So we had a little tornado drill with the family uh, we all went down to the basement and I was really proud. We, we brought chips and toilet paper and uh, you know, the baby had something to play with. So we got this. Your baby could play with toilet paper too. Well, he, he went, he went down there and he went straight for the bourbon. I'm like, this is my kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the DNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's go ahead let's go around the horn real quick. Uh, and, but first, before we hit some of our, our regulars, I want to introduce somebody that's new to the podcast. Uh, we have a stand in tonight. So Aaron Goldfarb, who you all have probably seen from a lot of articles out there online. So Aaron, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, even though I don't know how to use a computer, apparently. So <laughs> 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 it's okay. We'll let it slide this time. We'll uh, we'll do some tech support next time we need to uh, call in a pinch hitter here. <laughs> Absolutely. So just kind of give everybody a, a quick recap or kind of summary of like who you are, where you write, and everything like that. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, accidentally fell into becoming a booze writer. I uh, write a lot of whiskey articles, but I write cocktail articles and beer articles and food articles for places like Esquire, Punch, Fine Pair, Whiskey Advocate. Bourbon Plus, my favorite place to write. Ah, um, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a few books too. Uh, Hacking Whiskey, uh, most notably for your audience. Uh, Gather Around Cocktails was my most recent book. And um, 
just learned that uh, my kid has uh, the next two weeks off school. So I uh, think this is the end of my writing career for a while, at least. <laughs> <laughs> We're all trying to set up some sort of uh, daycares at home or I don't know. Maybe we should just like go out and like buy the like 5,000 piece puzzles off of Amazon and be like, here you go. This is your next two weeks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. So, uh, Blake, how you doing tonight? Doing well, yeah. Always good to be back. Um, just straight into my intro. I feel like we're kind of changing things up. So, you know, do I give the regular, hey, I'm Blake from Bourboner? Do I just talk about coronavirus? Or I mean, you can talk <laughs> about what's choice. happening in your yeah. area. I mean, it's, it's yeah, no, ours craziness is, um, happening. No, it's, well, I had the flu last week. So I feel like I was out and it wasn't the coronavirus. It was just the flu. So Are that was sure? not did fun. You, did you get tested? Yeah. Yeah, I got tested. I got tested. Um, well, I tested positive for the flu, so I guess I, I guess I didn't test negative for Corona. But yeah, there's been no cases in Florida that I'm aware of. Um, but no, it's just it's crazy. I mean, the TPC that's a huge thing in this area, and um, so they actually announced today that they're suspending all um, all fans from the tournament and you know th this golf tournament will bring in over a hundred thousand people to come and watch it. So. It was pretty disappointing. Um, you know, I was supposed to be, um, I was supposed to be going out uh, to uh, to the tournament uh, with my son tomorrow. So that's a little disappointing. And it's spring break for us. And as you can see, uh, my my daughter's like in the background. Um, so they're talking about extending spring break here as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, this should be interesting. I, I don't know. I'm I'm one who. I just think you've got like a 1% chance of it actually hitting and being devastated. So I'm like, I'll just be unprepared and 99% of the time I'll be correct. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just if that 1% gets me, but no. So longest intros for the longest episode we're about to get into. I, so. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right on point there. So, so Jordan, what's happening in your part of the world? Well, the corona hasn't been declared. So Western Eastern PA, right? There's a bunch of cases, nothing in Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh's, I don't want to say naive, but like right around today was the first time a little bit of unease and unsettledness kind of kicked in, right? And now that the NHL canceled the Penguins, right? People are super upset. But um, I'm sure we'll be seeing cases pop up super soon. I don't really even know if they're testing or if they have test kits here in Pittsburgh yet. So I'm sure there's cases that we don't know about. So... I don't know. Thankfully, it's a state-run liquor system, so there's tons of tons of bottles still on the shelves. Not saying people want to buy that one, but it's there. Absolutely. And Brian, in our part of the world. Yeah, your part of the world. Thanks for having me again, Brian, with Sipping Corn. Find me at bourbonjustice.com. Um, my only effect so far is tonight, instead of doing this, I was going to be drinking an Evan Williams 23-year-old uh, Old Fitzgerald 15 and the in the 101 12 year Evan Williams with Oof. the client and the client had travel restrictions and wasn't supposed to go anywhere. And so I got my thing canceled. So now it's personal because it kept me from my birth. <laughs> um, but other than that, um, it's it's hasn't really affected me. I've got my daughter home from Dayton. They kicked them out early. Uh, they won't be going back. Um, so just I, I've got my bourbon supply. I'll be all right. And, and one point for Aaron. Aaron, I, I have to tell you this before I forget. I tried to do from Hacking Whiskey the the uh, bacon-infused bourbon, yeah. and it was probably the biggest flop that I have ever created in my life. I, we'll, we'll need to talk offline. I need to know the secret because theoretically, everything about that I should just love, and I ruined both bourbon and bacon doing mine. That's funny. I, I always tell people it sounds harder to do fat washing than it is, and it's almost impossible to screw up, but I guess uh, uh, <laughs> it's <possible. laughs> yeah. I've actually had a very similar experience, Brian, so I, I have a few okay, tips. It's, you, you don't – you want to slowly render the bacon. Um, made the mistake of like – crispy and i think just the burntness came through so that's what i have um, yeah. yeah yeah it can't get black yeah absolutely no okay good bacon pursuit coming soon bacon pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> hey i'd go for i'd listen to that it sounds delicious peppercorn all over it so fred you've been kind of close to this because <laughs> i know at least with the corona stuff you've been actually reaching out to the distilleries kind of give us the latest on what's been happening with uh what distilleries are doing for preparing for this well, I mean, you ask them personally, a lot of them will say it's all bullshit. And then when it comes to like a corporate message, they'll come out and say, 
Um, well, we're, we're, we're closing uh, visitations starting Monday. So Beam uh, has closed uh, visitations for you know, Maker's Mark and uh, the other properties starting on Monday. Uh, uh, Brown Foreman announced the closures of their Kentucky facilities for visitations on Sunday and Jack Daniels uh, on Monday. Uh, New Riff has made similar announcements. I have not heard yet back from Heaven Hill. I've reached out to them uh, a couple times. I've not heard back from them yet. Uh, interestingly places like, you know, the smaller distillers seem to be the ones that are kind of like, you know what, we're still doing tours like, uh, MB Roland, um, in Western Kentucky was very proud to say that, you know what, we're still doing this. And, um, you know, so a lot of them have these kinds of plans in place for, for the visitor side and they're all continuing, uh, production. And I, and I think production is like, I think that's one of the hardest questions to answer is like, what if one of the workers gets test test positive? What's, what's the protocol there? Like, I mean, I really don't know what the manufacturing protocol is for when you have a pandemic and someone tests positive for something that gets out into the market. You know, do you have a recall? I mean, uh, I mean, those are the kinds of questions that they have to be taking, but at the same time, the Kentucky distillers association is meeting with the governor's office who has been meeting with the vice president, mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're like three degrees away from, you know, uh, the highest office in the land here when it comes to what can affect the Kentucky distilleries. So I'm not a, I'm not an expert and I'm not going to claim to be, but from what I understand is that this is all basically through respiratory and oral uh, is kind of how it gets transferred really easily. So unless people are like spitting in the mash tubs, I'm not too sure exactly. Even that is probably gets even that out. alcohol yeah. would. Right. Yeah. And so I'm not too sure, honestly, if uh, even if a worker does, you know, come in and ha and actually is affected. I think the only thing that it might actually affect is just the production. Uh, probably just send everybody home, do shut down production for X amount of days, come back, do a deep clean, yep. go back, go back to work. Yeah. But there is this whole thing where you have to um, the, the government's issue, like where people had it, what what, what they touched, where they went. You know, I was, um, you know, I was somewhere and got it in and, and someone was there the day after me and I got an email about it. And, you know, that was kind of one of the a personal scare for me. But, you know, I, I don't know, like if somebody works in a factory, you know, does the government then require the that factory to, to issue a statement to its consumers? You know, I just don't know. It, I mean, there's not really a precedent for any of this. Uh, it's very, very scary. And I think it's it's more so, right, as much as they might want to keep manufacturing, right? They're just one part of the manufacturing puzzle. So if a farmer who distills the grains and drops them off, right, not distills, I'm sorry, if the farmer who harvests the grains and drops them off or the trucking company drops them off or they can't drop them off because they have the coronavirus, you don't got any grain to mash, you're not doing much, right? Same with barrel stuff like that. So I think it goes the whole, or to Fred's point, maybe you don't have to notify consumers, but then you got to notify your whole manufacturing chain. Right. And maybe folks then don't want to drop off supplies because they're afraid that they're going to catch up for their employees. So I think it's just not as simple as, you know, the virus doesn't survive much longer, you know, once it's out of somebody's system in the air or when it touched something for more than a few hours. So consumers should be safe. But it's more how does that impact everyone they interact with up and down the whole supply chain? Yeah, I think probably the biggest issue this really is facing right now is the tourism aspect, which has mm -hmm. been. Really, it's been what uh, the industry has been hanging its hat on, you know, with the with the rise of these like uh, the trade wars. You know, this was the one thing that everyone said, well, we still got like uh, domestic growth and we got tourism. And so, you know, this is you know, you, you, you take out the, the, the more than two million people coming here to, to visit Kentucky distilleries. Uh, I mean, my God, there there are talks in town about impacting the Derby. I mean. I can't even imagine not having the Derby. Brian, can you? I mean, I just can't. I can't. I can't envision it. Now, I heard that today too. They're um, talking about maybe postponing, and it's you know they're still looking at it. No decisions made yet, but that's it's just crazy talk. I mean, let's face it, Churchill. I mean, they'll be like, "Yeah, just bet from home." You know, uh, <laughs> who cares? Just bet from home. Right. They'll yeah. find, sign up for Twin Spires Club and they'll give you, you know, $50 yeah. free or whatever. And they'll be laughing all the way to the bank. 
the, yeah. the other the other component of this that uh, should be getting Blake excited actually because of Sealbox is that this is going to be one of the moments where we see a, an enormous increase of uh, of shipments and uh, people don't want to get out of their house so they're not going to go to a liquor store what are they going to do they're going to buy like they're going to visit Sealbox.com or wherever. <laughs> And uh, get Slide their to 20 alcohol. after the show, Fred. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's 40, Blake. Yo, I'm 40 now. Okay, <laughs> but uh, you know, that, that's that's what's going to happen is they're going to get deliveries. I mean, we're all right, we're getting deliveries from, from Whole Foods and Kroger right now, so it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I think yeah. there was uh, somebody had actually talked about on our Discord chat a little bit earlier through Patreon. And they were saying, well, what happens if Corona gets spread into Amazon and into these delivery services? Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a true concern. Uh, the other part of this is, thank God, they're heavily automated, right? There's robots that basically pack those boxes for everybody. But what if someone sneezes on a robot? <laughs> what <laughs> if, like it's what if somebody mean, sneezes on your pocket right before they hand it to you? What if right. this was I'm, all just a way for the robots to take control and they actually created <laughs> right. coronavirus? I'm with you on that. They created you know, it. I mean, everyone's talking about Walking Dead, but what if this is really Terminator about to happen? Hmm? <laughs> they planted the seed. It's I'm surprised you're not pushing vodka conspiracies, Fred. Yeah. What did yeah. you say? <laughs> I'm surprised you're not pushing vodka conspiracies. Which, speaking of vodka conspiracies, <laughs> Jordan, was today's email like uh, a backhanded compliment to uh, to What's Tito's? That? Oh, yesterday. What, what, what email are we talking? Hey, hold on. Yeah, let's let's set the stage here because I have no idea so what email you're talking about. Breaking Bourbon newsletter, right for Whiskey Wednesday. And one out, and it was a PSA on how to make your own hand sanitizer. So we did give Tito's the nod. And the fact that they are aggressively letting consumers know whenever they tweet or interact with them on social media that no, you cannot use Tito's for hand sanitizer because it is not sixty percent <laughs> alcohol, right? So we did yeah. we, we do give them credit on that one, right? But I mean, let's be real: if you're going to use hand sanitizer and you must use bourbon, we prefer you drink it, but at least use one hundred twenty proof bourbon to do something right. But there you was know, a I, comment in there to Tito's about like, well, at least they're clearing some of the facts up. And I thought that was a like, yeah, <laughs> handcrafted, oh, you know, yeah. made in Texas kind of. Uh, okay, just made sure I wasn't reading into it too much. But once again, vodka fails. I mean, you, you look at it, it's like everyone's like starting to champion it for something that it can may, may be valuable for. And it can't even do hand sanitizer. <laughs> right do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's a perfect way to end this. I don't really want to talk about coronavirus anymore. Do you all? Yeah, no, I'm done. No, well, no, that, that was too enough. much hysteria. Yeah, that was enough. Funny. All right, good. So let's move on to uh, kind of the meat of the show here. Um, let's, should we wait for Blake to open his bottle here because we can all hear him? Is, is this all that loud? Man? <laughs> <laughs> don't you have the mute control too? Well, he already muted. Like, what, it's my game. There we go. I'll mute him. All right, there perfect. Why oh, didn't he remove control. the plastic we'll him, we'll, before the show started? You know, Aaron, you would think 42 times into this, he would have figured it out by now. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is just like, it's every three Blake's weeks. about to get sanctioned. Yeah, it's it's either that, his Wi-Fi dies. I mean, it's it keeps going. So, all right. So let's kind of get into the meat of the show because the one thing that we've all kind of seen is just the hysteria that has surrounded Blanton's. And... To kind of just give a little bit of background and context, there is a great article that was posted by Chuck Cowdery back in 2013, and he gave a history of Blanton. So I'm just going to go ahead and just take a like a minute or two just to read this, just so everybody kind of gets up to speed on it. Because I know we've had people request like, hey, why don't you do an episode on the history of Blanton's? Um, come to find out, there's probably not a whole lot that we could do a whole episode about. So this is going to be it right here. So if you think back in the 1980s, it was a bleak period for bourbon. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Golly. <laughs> Everybody's, Everybody's just popping bottles. They don't even give a shit what's going on around here. I'm listening, really. I thought it was a good timing. See, Aaron, this is what I'm talking about. Nobody, Nobody's learned the proper etiquette for how to pour their bourbon. I've, before I've got start. my mute button. I'll use the mute button. I don't have a camera, but I pre-poured everything and... Jordan, you're next. Go. Oh, I've already popped a bottle or two on this show, so I think we're good. <laughs> All right. I think everybody's got their bottle pops out of the way. All right. So in the 90s, or sorry, in the 80s, sales were down, inventories were high, profits were under intense pressure, and whiskey assets were changing hands. 
Most of the large producers were no longer independent. Instead, they were part of conglomerates and with a portfolio of a household names back then. Back then, F. Ross Johnson was the powerful CEO of Nabisco. Nabisco had a subsidiary called Standard Brands that included Fleshman's Distilling. Ferdy Falk was the CEO of Fleshman's and Bob Baranescas, Baranescas, I think I'm, I'm going to screw that up, was the president. In 1983, Johnson decided to sell Standard Brands to Grand Metropolitan. A few years later, Grand Metro Metropolitan merged with Guinness to form Diageo. Grand Metropolitan already had a thriving drinks business that included J&B Scotch and Smirnoff Vodka. Assuming they would be replaced after the sale, Falk and Baran Baraniscus, I know that's bad, resigned and started to start their own company. Falk was previously an executive with Shenley, so he approached Meshlam Rickless, whose conglomerate owned Shenley, about selling some assets. Falk and Baranskis originally tried to acquire Old Charter, but Rickless always needed money, so he agreed to sell Ancient Age Bourbon brand and the distillery that produced it. Then it was called the Albert B. Blanton Distillery, today's Buffalo Trace. Falk and Baranskis called their new company Age International. As the name suggests, they believe Bourbon's future was outside of the U.S. One of their first moves was to enlist the master distiller at the time, Elmer T. Lee, with the creation of Blanton's Single Barrel Bourbon to appeal to the Japanese market, but with multiple extensions in Japan and the U.S. In 1991, Falk and Baranska sold 22.5% interest in Age International to Japan's Takura Shuza with the right of first refusal to purchase the remaining shares. In 1992, Falk and Baranska sold their shares to Takara for $20 million. Takara immediately sold the distillery to Sazerac, but retained the corporate entity and brand Tregsmart. Today, Sazerac still owns Buffalo Trace, and Buffalo Trace still produces all the whiskey for Age and Age, Blanton's, and other Age International products and brands, using mash build number two, which is also being used for bourbons like Rock Hill Farms as well. Chris Falk commented on the article, and he said that that was his father, Ferdy, had passed away from cancer in 2000. But Blanton's was the original super premium brand, and he said he can remember watching him draw the packaging idea on a napkin back in 1983. So I followed all of that very closely. So yep. Kept I, I'd like that. to add. I'd like to add to that because this is something that gets really lost uh, in the history of of that brand. And I would argue we could have a whole show on the history of it, uh, but. In the 19, basically, when the Albert Blanton was was head of the the distillery, he used to, um, he used to take people out and he used to pick barrels for them, and that he would actually put that into the Kentucky retail market, effectively making it the like a, a, a single barrel asset, but they weren't really calling them single barrels back then. And so people, you know, Sazerac would always use it, use it in their marketing that it was the first commercially available single barrel that often got pushed back by people, but indeed it, it was. But that brand uh, had a huge impact on the world. You know, in my book, Bourbon, I, I wrote about like how important it was for Japan and how it kind of opened that market up. Another thing that Blanton's did that was really important is it pissed off Maker's Mark and it started making fun of Maker's Mark and advertisements. For the saying like, oh, you have to talk about your wax because your whiskey isn't any good. So they kind of like, uh, you know, played with Maker's Mark in, in their own game and they went back and forth. And so they had like this state, uh, uh, Blanton's created this statewide tasting competition in which they selected tasters in Lexington and uh, Louisville to, uh, to have a taste off between Maker's and Blanton's. Blanton's won Lexington. And uh, Makers won Louisville. So Bland's is a really, really important brand in the return of bourbon. And um, this return of the, the, the introduction of the of gold Blanton's, it's like, for God's sake, it's about time. You know, it's about well, time. I want to well, get to that because that's a, that's a big part of today's show. But what I want to do is I kind of want to just trace this back about two years. And I want anybody that has a theory on why the hell did Blanton's just skyrocket in popularity. I know that we've seen it on some uh, TV shows and everything like that, but <clears throat> was there was there something that happened that I missed that all of a sudden this round bottle with a horse on top just just went crazy? I I have a theory, so I don't want to 
jump in, but I guess I will. So I, I think it's, um, and I wish I had notes because I talked to uh, Chris Comstock about this the other day about their supply. The supply is not, the supply is basically, I, I think it's like 5X of what it was a few years ago um, is what they're producing now. So it's not nearly as bad as people think, but in my opinion, what started to happen was a lot of these distributors and stores started seeing what ha- was happening with Pappy and, you know, the antique collection. And so they started allocating on the distribution side. So then instead of stores just like, yeah, order it whenever you want, they'd say, oh, we can only give you two bottles. Well, then the stores start telling the customers, hey, look, I'm only getting two bottles of this. It's at that price point that makes it, you know, the, the high end, the bottle's cool. It's it's It tastes good. And so then as you know, that started building, you go into a store and see two bottles, you grab them and then there's an empty shelf. So then the, I think the hype just started building and scarcity sells. So now every time people see it on the shelf, it's like, oh, I've got to grab as many bottles as I can find or as I can get, because who knows when I'll see it again. Um, and that all seems to be happening, happening over the last two to three years. Um, I tell the story of that Blanton's was actually the first barrel pick I ever did for Bourboner. And that was back in 2015. And I remember the, uh, the retailer marked it up to, I think it was $64. And I lost, you know, so many people saying that he, they're not going to work with the retailer that was trying to gouge. Like I bought five cases. I had a few friends buy a bunch of cases. And now if I got a Blanton's barrel, you know, I'd, be gone in a day and you could probably sell for a hundred bucks a bottle or something crazy like that. But um, I still think it's all kind of like a, uh, an artificial demand or an artificial shortage created by that middle tier. But that's just my opinion. I think it also has to do with the fact that right. So around that time, and, and don't get me wrong, we've been fans of Blanton's. I think back in 2014, we ca- called it out on the site that we weren't sure why people were overlooking it. But then is Buffalo Trace in general, right? So all their bourbons started becoming more known to folks. People started realizing, oh, Pep Van Winkle comes from Buffalo Trace. Oh, BTAC, what's that? Okay. And then Elmer got really big, right? And then others started getting big. So especially if they wanted a single barrel, right? They'd go in, hey, can I get an Elmer? Oh, you can't get an Elmer, but look at this cool bottle. You get this little horse topper. It has a little wax on it, little bag. Sometimes you just find it in the box. Why don't you go for that instead, right? And it was just one of the, it's just one of those things where people just want the next thing, right? So, all right, so I can't get any other Buffalo Trace product. What else you got? You got blends, you can get that pretty easy. I'll take one of those, right? And then people start doing a little research, especially if people are really into bourbon. They realize that there's Blanton's Gold, there's um, Blanton's Straight from the Barrel, which used to be, again, easy to find, except two years ago, it was what, around two years ago, I think Master of Malt stopped shipping, right? And a lot of store shops stopped shipping from over in Europe. And uh, it was just that snowball effect, right? There's no rhyme or reason to a lot of stuff. It's just People like to hoard. People like to know it's cool. Blanton's caught on, right? Everyone, I'm sure, has friends who ask, you know, what should I buy in the store? It used to be really simple to say, oh, just pick up a bottle of Blanton's. It's great bourbon, reasonably priced. Just go for it, right? I still say that, and then I catch myself going, except you're not going to be able to find it anymore, which stinks. But um, I think a lot of it is just that snowball effect that took place with consumers, especially around Buffalo Trace products. You brought up something very important, Jordan, is you brought up um, Elmer T. Lee. And... Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this a lot since Kenny posed the question to us before the show about why did Blanton's take off? And I remember specifically after Elmer died, you could not find Elmer T. Lee. You could not find it. And the one bottle that everybody recommended after that, because it was accessible, was Blanton's. You know, it wasn't Rock Hill Farms. It was always Blanton's was the was the bourbon that people recommended after Elmer T. Lee passed away there couldn't be a more fitting bourbon to recommend since that was the one, um, that he brought, you know, he brought to life and, you know, Elmer kind of gets forgotten. You know, Elmer doesn't get talked about as much as, uh, you know, some of the other deceased distillers like Booker No and Parker Beam. And it's a real shame because he was a Titan of a distiller. And I, I think that he would be, you know, smiling quite happily to know that, his stuff was being, it was very difficult to get. He wouldn't be very happy with the price gouging, but uh, I do believe that that is when it all started was in the, in the quest to find Elmer. They got Blanton's and liked it. Fred, I kind of remember a little, there was a, at least a couple year time period where to me, it was the opposite of that. 
um, people wanted Blanton's and, and Elmer was aged a couple of years more than Blanton's. And I couldn't mm-hmm. figure out why people wanted Blanton's instead of Elmer. I mean, there was a time period where it overtook Elmer and I don't know anything about the production. I don't know anything about what's being withheld, but it, it, to Blake's point, it sure mm-hmm. looks that way. So, there's another thing that's sort of happening right now, and that is Buffalo Trace and Heaven Hill are implementing new systems where you can only purchase allocated items uh, at Heaven Hill. Sometimes it's once a month. And in the case of Blanton's at Buffalo Trace, they're now doing this once every three months of actually scanning your driver's license and turning people away. And this is because if anybody is unaware, the line that has been growing for Blanton's at the distillery has just gotten chaotic. I'm talking like two to 300 people that are waiting at six o'clock in the morning to get a bottle of regular Blanton's at the distillery. And so, you know, Aaron, I'll kind of want to pose this question to you, get you, uh, get you involved here. Do you think this new system has a chance to actually succeed and work? Well, I was going (laughs) to. Aaron, you're, you're cutting out, buddy. I think we lost him. Yeah, he and Blake are sharing Wi-Fi. <laughs> if I just want to bring him on camera, we're on the same yeah. Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, try to try to drop and come back on and come back if you can, like maybe plug in or something. I'm not too sure. We'll uh, we'll, we'll get you we'll get you in here. <laughs> um. All right. So so we'll take that in a different direction. So, Blake, do you yeah. think it has a, an actual chance to? succeed with this particular kind of system so so what's the actual system again sorry i was typing whatever you know <laughs> trying to type <laughs> all right so go straight to jordan they're, Just they're only it. allowed they're only allowed how many bottles of, like one a month or something it's this is what happens when like the teacher calls on you and you weren't paying attention you're like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know the system heaven hill has in place they've had it in place for like two years at heaven hill where they scan your license when you buy yeah, yeah. like buffalo trace implemented the same thing yeah, I mean, you know, you think about uh, Willett did that for a while, and then they had their their do not sell to list and everything. It, it'll it'll definitely slow things down, but um, I don't know. I, I I mean, I think that's good because ultimately, you want some bottles at the distillery whenever people come and visit. You know, I had this experience a few weeks ago when we were up there, and a friend of mine's like, "Man, none of these." you know, none of these distilleries have any bottles. Like I thought I'd be able to get something cool. You know, Heaven Hill at least had, I don't even remember what we got, but I think they had a William Heaven Hill there. So at least there was something. Um, But that's the hard part is you don't want just the locals to come grab everything that is available, turn around and throw it up on Craigslist or wherever people are selling these days. Um, We don't do that in Kentucky, man. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) it's it's never happened, right? Yeah, but, you you know, so you kind of want to spread it out a little bit. So I think that'll help. Um, But, you know, it's like anything else. People are going to do what they want to do. They're going to send their sister. They're going to send their cousin. They're going to send if they really want it that bad. But overall, hopefully it kind of spreads the allocation a little bit further. I mean, I'll say since I'm not located in Kentucky, right, I, at least from a Heaven Hill standpoint, I actually appreciate that they do that now because it seems more often than not, whenever I go down to Heaven Hill and I always stop by when I'm in town, these tend to have a few bottles, yeah. right? Uh-huh. That's, I think, based on the fact that they're helping to limit people from buying them. So from that standpoint, I think it's fantastic, right? Especially being somebody who's visiting Kentucky and when I do go, I make sure to stop by the distilleries and buy stuff, but now they have stuff to buy, um, mm-hmm. which I'm super appreciative of. Yeah. And that's actually part of the reason this was actually implemented was Freddie Johnson was on the stage with Fred at a legend series recently. And he talked exactly about this, that this is all because of just trying to counteract the flipping game. And if you can limit of what people can get, then you can do that. And plus they want to reward people that are traveling from all around the country to go and visit the distillery. And they want to get something unique while they're there. And this is an opportunity to actually make that happen. It's you a, know, they could also release a lot more bottles, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to That's that. That's an option. Yeah, they could do yeah. that. It, we'll, it, it's it's a difficult, it's difficult. You know, I, I look at it, I look at it from the perspective of like every time, you know, they, they, the distillers like wish for something and then they get it. And then like five years later, they're like, oh, shit, <laughs> you know. So like now, like I remember when they were lobbying for this, they were like begging to have special bottles. They were begging to have this attention and this FaceTime with the consumers. 
And now you hear them and they're like, crap, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, like now they're facing some of the same problems that their retailer partners have. So a lot more headaches for them, for sure. And personally, you know, three months is, I think, a little bit generous. I would have rather seen a year yeah. because mm -hmm. if there's two to 300 people lining up to do this and they're bringing their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, mm -hmm. their aunts and their uncles to to get a bottle of Blanton's like let's let's just nip this like it's Blanton's after all right like it is it's good whiskey but let's let's try to let's try to curb this because I I don't see a reason why people should be going this nuts over it and if they have a bottle of bourbon and I, I think I remember seeing a lot of the comments when people announced that this system was getting put in place they're like oh like why are you gonna hurt your you know your your biggest consumers and your cheerleaders and I'm like they make a lot of different whiskey. There's a lot of different bourbon out there on the market. Like don't pin yourself into just like that one bottle, you know, like that mash build makes a, a lot of different stuff. Right. So like, you don't, you don't need to be pigeonholing yourself into just one particular kind of whiskey for everything you drink. Yeah. I'm, I was at a store one time and, um, a guy was asking the clerk for if the, he's like, you guys got any Blanton's? It was a total wine. And, and then he's like, no, sorry, we don't have any Blanton's. And I was like, Hey man, like, Actually, they've got a Hancock single barrel pick that they've done. And I, it was like, I think it was seven years old or something. Um, the exact same mash bill, you know, maybe it wasn't in Warehouse H or whatever it is, but pretty much the exact same thing is like, I don't want that crap. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> never mind. No horse. I, I mean, why bother? Well, yeah. you, know, you bring up a really good point, though, Brian, yeah, right? Yeah. So the whole point, the whole reason they had the horse in the first place, right? And way back when. One, it's spelled lens, which is cool, but two, it entice people to keep buying it. So then you right. do find people who actually, you know, for multitudes of reasons, right? And, and I'm not judging whatsoever, who once they find something and they do want to collect it just for that purpose, I realize you can buy the stopper from Buffalo Trace itself, right? But they actually then want to start collecting the bottles just to get the topper. So not only do they like it, but now they're like, well, crap, I need to get all the rest of them, right? So yep. now their demand is, well, I just don't need one or two. Now I got to find all the I, letters. I got two of the letters. I got to fill it out. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, <laughs> they've kind of created a, a little bit of a headache in that sense for themselves. If there was no letters on the bottle, that would definitely eliminate a little bit of that from some. Well, and, and a lot of people in the comments have said that the dump date being on every bottle, you know, yep. how, how many posts have you seen? You know, oh, my kid was born, or, you know, oh, I'm looking for this dump date. Yep. Oh, I got Lord. married, I bought a house, I mean, whatever. They want that yeah, date. Yeah, whatever it is, they've, they, they want that date on there. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's marketing genius, is what it is. Yeah. It's a product of success, you know. I think Fred alluded to this a little bit. Of they worked really hard to make these things popular and you know get special releases out of the distillery, and then I, I don't want to say it backfired, but I think it caused them more headaches than they probably they were thinking yeah. it would. But it's a product of success. So at the end of the day, I don't think they mind it. No, you know, the, no, no, the no. one thing that none of these companies are doing is they're not utilizing technology. You know, and Kenny, I'd like to get your your thoughts on this because you're the tech guy. But how hard would it be for them to like create like an order and hold or some some kind of system for online to connect with the point of sale where someone could plan their trip and then come pick up a bottle? I just I just feel like there's so many opportunities to alleviate these problems that they never seem to explore. They they're stuck in these inundated, antiquated stand in line, look at an ID kind of crap. I think it's just simple e-commerce is that a lot of, and I think we've touched on a lot of times, even just retailers and everybody else in general, like this type of market is, is behind the curve of what we see in every other type of industry. And so if they don't take the initiative to try to figure out like, how do we get our hands in the, how do we get our product into the hands of consumers faster and easier and less friction and make them a happy consumer? If, if you don't take that into account, then they're not going to do anything about it. Uh, you know, the other thing is, is that if you look at what Sazerac is building with Blanton's and Buffalo Trace and everything, like they don't really, I mean, they're going to sell out no matter what. So do they need to go through all that extra effort to invest in an e-commerce platform to invest in something where like, I, I don't know whether they have their own online, put your email in a database and come and pick your bottle up on this date kind of thing. I don't know if they really need to. Uh, so it, it, that kind of, like I said, there's, there's, it's a double edged sword from there. So, and you do actually, so Fred, I mean, to, it's a great point that you make both Kenny and Fred, but I, you do see some distilleries doing that, right? So look at new riff, 
Look at Angel's Envy with their main club, right? They both do that. So when they have special releases come out, you can pre-buy and they give you 30 days to pick them up or X number of days to pick up. I that's think that's, it. it's great. And it's also great for, again, if somebody's out in town to be like, all right, I got a month to go pick this up. I'll plan a quick trip around this or something like that, right? And it drives people there. And then I'm sure once they're there, they're like, well, shit, I'm here. I might as well buy some other stuff, whether it's from that distillery or a local store around there or whatever, but it's just great for the local economy in general. Um, and I wish more distilleries did that. Angel's Envy is absolutely crushing their special bottles. Yeah. Uh, people make events out of that, and I have never talked to one unhappy person out of there. I mean, I hear I hear so many unhappy people coming out of Heaven Hill. There's so many pe unhappy people coming out of out of Sazerac. Really, no one from Beam, but I don't think anyone's necessarily going there for special releases. But the the, the key distilleries that have special releases, of all of them, Angel's Envy is crushing it. By far, that program that they have, people love it. Yeah, and plus, it's an easy way for you to kind of like allocate these things online. And not only that, is you basically sell it before anybody actually picks it up. So mm -hmm. it's 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 instead of like putting it out there and hoping people come, like it's all online. If you make it easy and frictionless, then you're gonna have a much better way to you know have that kind of like cash flow and that pipeline coming in too. Man, what if they did like bourbon futures where you could like you know, buy like a case of Blanton's five years from now or something. <laughs> so technically that's kind of what a uh, Bardstown bourbon company is doing. So they, their barrel pick now is you pay a thousand dollar deposit to get it. And then, um, which I guess is not technically futures, but then you let it age as long as you want. And essentially you just pay the, the same price for whatever the standard bottling is, whether you let it go to 10 years or you let it go six months um yeah so. i yeah I, i'm familiar with that it's just not it's not proven but like Blanton's not nearly proven. as exciting to yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean I, that, that it is it is a Fair concept enough. for sure but like i mean imagine like if you could if you could buy a futures of pappy 23 right now when your child is born or something like that mm -hmm. you do it in mm -hmm. a heartbeat yep you know but no yeah. one would nobody would want to track that accountant Somebody yeah. put uh, in the or Eric yeah. put in the chats about um, basically that's how Bordeaux works and yeah you know the it's not like a Pappy twenty three where you're waiting twenty three years but there is some time there and it is interesting to see how that whole market works and I mean it's pretty crazy we may get there one day the ghost yachts that's the one thing that we don't that we don't have that the wine world has is like these really high level uh, business people called mm -hmm. negociants who basically broker every single thing. And I think that's why Angel's Envy is so successful with that program is Wes Henderson is kind of like uh, a hybrid, you know, in this world. He's, he's such a business forward leaning mind and, uh, you know, has his dad's DNA. Anyway. All right. I want to shift topic a little bit because this is still going to be Blanton's, but the biggest news that happened last week, or was it two weeks ago, whatever it was, was the idea and the announcement of, Blanton's Gold coming to the U.S. What do you get if you mix Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how? That's Two Bar Spirits. Two Bar Spirits traces its roots to a ranch in rural Texas run by the founder, Nathan Kaiser's family for six generations. Nathan grew up on the ranch with stories of relatives bootlegging moonshine. And after moving into Seattle, he wanted to keep the family tradition alive, and he opened Two Bar Spirits in 2012. They're a very traditional distillery, making everything from scratch and each day starts by milling a thousand pounds of grain. Their entire product lineup consists of only two whiskeys, their moonshine and the only bourbon made in Seattle. Both bottles are being featured in Rackhouse Whiskey Club's next box. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse ships out two of the featured distillery's finest bottles, along with some cool merchandise in a box delivered to your door every two months. Go to RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com to check it out and try some two bar for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. The biggest news that happened last week, or was it two weeks ago, whatever it was, was the idea and the announcement of Blanton's Gold coming to the U.S. And for anybody that has been a bottle chaser or you've been into bourbon for a little bit, we've all known that Blanton's Gold and Blanton Straight from the Barrel are something that 
we gravitate towards because you're like, oh, it's higher proof. And and now we're all like, well, and it's got a shiny gold horse. So, of course, I want all these. As Ryan said earlier, I'm with the I'm with the ski with all the gold letters on it now. So the, the, the there's a few questions that arise with this. And the first one that I'm going to come to is tariffs. Because one thing that we've seen is that tariffs are being, it's being catastrophic to the whiskey industry in regards of just it, it's both sides of the coin here. Now, there is the idea that people are saying, okay, well, if we are going to have to pay tariffs, then let's go ahead and hold more whiskey back that we know that we can sell to our existing consumer base here in the US. Do you all think that this is a reaction to that? Or do you think this was planned out a little bit farther in advance, and they said, "You know what? We're going to just do this because we're just, let's go ahead and make some more headlines." I'll go first, right? I think a hundred percent has to do with tariffs, right? I think they are looking in real time at how to react. I um, I think they saw a business opportunity, and they're going for it, right? They don't want to have um, products sitting there, or they don't want to overcharge consumers um, to needlessly sell to no one in Europe if no one's going to be paying that price. And they saw, hey. Blends is hot. Let's make it happen. And 100% that played into it. Whether there's a little pre-work behind the scenes going into it, potentially, but don't get me wrong, the current tariff situation 100% played into this. I also want to mention that in the press release, they also said that this is going to be an SRP of $120 for this particular bottle too. So don't forget that. Yep. I'd like to say that at the top of Buffalo Trace is probably the single smartest person in the entire spirits industry, Mark Brown. That man had this plan probably five years ago and had a rollout leading up to it. And this year is probably going to be like um, like some additional Weller products, maybe a single barrel or something like that. I mean, you're going to start seeing like Buffalo Trace kind of like take their super premiums and dice them up into more limited edition releases. And it's it's all about getting another skew, getting another press release out, another conversation. Oh, they they own a lot of the conversation market. They own a lot of the store. They own almost all the skews that all the retailers want. Mm -hmm. And if they every time they add one, they've got another one. So they have another reason to have a meeting with a retailer. They have another meeting to ha uh, have a meeting. Another reason to have a meeting with a an on premise person. Platin's Gold, in my opinion, is probably just one of the actually Weller foolproof last year was the beginning of the rollout of seeing the uh, kind of evolution of what Buffalo Trace is planning to do with their super premium product. They're dicing them up, gradually raising those uh, price, raising the prices up a little bit more and making them even more valuable. It's, yeah, it's a, I don't know. That that's a it's looking at it from a marketing standpoint, genius, yeah. Um I don't know. There's there's a lot better values out there in in my book and I just I I try to resist so much of the hype. Um and I I, I like the ancient age products probably better than than their other mash bill and and other than some Weller 12 or the the B Tech uh, William LaRue Weller, the ancient age my, is my favorite mash bill. Um, but the, the, the marketing just, it, it rubs me the wrong way. I get with it. Him. And I wish Aaron was able to stay on because he could speak very highly to this uh, with his experience at Esquire and some of the other more industry facing publications. I'm just telling you, man, you could just throw, you could, you could dangle uh, any Weller, Blanton's, even Buffalo Trace, you know, out, outside of a Manhattan window and you'll have like 50 bro dudes chasing it down. Yep. It's the stuff is crazy. And, and it's genius. And congratulations to them for doing it. It's absolute genius. But you know, there's so much four roses and wild turkey out there that that and, and other brands that are so much better and so much more of a value. I, I just don't get it personally. So, so then that, then that, then that, that's not really a knock on them. That's basically, that's our job to say, Hey guys, can't get this, you know, try this. And I, and I think Jordan does a great job of that. I think Blake does a great job of that. Kenny, you, you really just drink it all. So <laughs> <laughs> equal opportunity drinker. Absolutely. That's right.
And so, Fred, I kind of want to like take a counter argument to, to kind of what you said a little bit, because there was something that came up in the chat uh, by Dave Presson, uh, and he had mentioned that, you know, he thinks that this has to do with like increased stock that's resulting from ramped up production. However, I kind of look at it and think like, well, maybe they're just taking and, and to take Jordan's side of this, maybe they're taking away from the European allocation now and just shifting to the United States because we've all been on tours here. Right. And we all know we've been in the Blanton's bottling hall. Mm -hmm. Every day you're in there, they are bottling Blanton's and they're doing it around the clock every single day. And it doesn't seem that they can keep up with the demand. So where is all this extra inventory coming from? If you don't think it's just like taking away from European allocation and from tariffs, if like, how are they able to keep pumping out more product? So uh, again, this is, in my opinion, this has all been planned. These are not knee jerk uh, business people. These are very smart, strategic, uh, especially when it comes to marketing, and they happen to have great whiskey. And I just think this was a part of it. Did they change their European allocation? Hey, maybe they did, but I think this uh, product was always planned. Maybe, maybe it got bumped up a little bit for for uh, anticipation of more tariffs or continued tariffs. But um, I, I think this has always been in in creation. And I think we're going to see a lot more from uh, from that distillery with new products coming out of their heavyweight pro- brands like Weller and Blanton's. And, you know, I don't think we'll see anything added to the Buffalo Trace Antique collection, but I think you'll start seeing more limited releases. I got to push back yeah. just a little bit on that, too, though, Fred. So I think don't get me wrong. I think it's super smart if they were planning this for a few years. Right. But I think I would categorize them just as smart for being a very smart businessman. If they read the current situation, they read the current landscape, the current yeah. tariffs and said, all right, how can we capitalize this? Right. How can we turn this around and make it so that it works in our favor? Right. I'd say that'd be a just as smart individual and just as smart move. So while it may be planned, right. I got to give them, I, I'd hope I'd give them credit for reading the current landscape and saying, mm-hmm. what can we do to make this work in our favor? And hey, maybe both are right. Yeah, you know? exactly. You know, yeah. so like uh, what I know is I'm not running a billion dollar spirits <laughs> company. <laughs> I'm so, sitting here. <laughs> so I, um, this isn't confirmed, but it was basically like kind of backdoor confirmed of Buffalo Trace production. So they were p- producing about 12,000 barrels a year in 95. By 2010, that was around 100,000 barrels. And by 2018, it was 250,000 barrels. Um so may not be exact, but gives you an idea of the ramp up they've been doing over the last you know two decades. So when you talk about they, they may not have had to steal from the European allocation, that's where I think there is more barrels that are going around. Now, whether or not it's just a you, you know, if it's really because of tariffs or it's just because, you know, take advantage of the U.S. market a little more. I, I, I think it could be a little bit of both. Maybe it turned out to be good timing. But at the end of the day, I think they love the new press releases. They love the new brand extensions. Um, you know, what was it? Um, is it Benchmark that's getting the next redo? You know, we've seen them do it with Weller now, the 1792 Benchmark. And I think, what you know, they've kind of evolved the E.H. Taylor brand to have a new release every year. Um, I think we'll just, like Fred said, we'll just keep seeing – new or uh, several new releases each year because they want to be able to go back to the retailer, the distributor, the customer, and everybody likes something that's shiny and new. Um, My God, they need to scrub that turret of benchmark. That bottle is disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) They had some, some hang up with that. I know they were, uh, were going through with it. I forget what it was, but apparently that got delayed a little bit, but you know, I think, well, the EH Taylor one's about to drop the marriage or whatever it is. Um, I, I'm sure we haven't seen the last new label for Weller. And um, yeah, I, I mean, ultimately I, I, I don't think the Blanton's gold is going to be a big allocation. So it'll be gone or impossible to find, but here we are talking about it. So it, it worked from their perspective. Um, I'm sure. Um, Cause it'll be sold out before it even touches uh, a retail shelf. Yeah, but let's take let's let let's also look, take a look at what everyone else is doing here. We're seeing Brown Foreman do something similar with Old Forester. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we've seen Heaven Hill 
uh, do some things just like this with Elijah Craig Rye. So every company right now is coming out with these extensions to have a continued conversation. And really, we're we're in that spot because we're all out there looking for it. You know, as soon yeah. as something comes out, you know, how many people are wedding, you know, calling up their retailers to, to get the bottle? And that's where we're at right now. This is uh, the the distillers are gaming the hunt. They're 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 tracking the consumers. You know, they don't have to spend a lot of money on marketing. Hell, they could be watching this podcast right now and studying the chat just to know that, you know, for every one of you that are on the chat, there's a, a hundred in, mm -hmm. in a market they want to yep. target. So that's where we are right now. And I think the key point of that too, right? And I think underlying what you're saying, Fred, is people want new, right? So all these brand extensions, everything else, right? People are on the quote unquote hunt for bourbon, but it's kind of turned to the, to the I'm going to use the car model, right? Analogy. People just want, what's the newest thing for 2019? I realized this was hot in 2018, but it also existed. What's brand new this year? What's coming out? Mm -hmm. So it's like this weird game, this weird game theory where, Distilleries now pigeonhole themselves. Do they need a new product, right? Either a new product, or just a brand extension, something every single year or multiple times a year to keep consumers interested in their in their brand, um, which you've never seen in years past before, right? So it's like whole new territory for everyone. And those that aren't doing that, right, are going to be left in the dust a little bit. Um, yeah. So... So yeah, and it, I, there's one thing that I kind of want to circle back on that, that Blake had mentioned earlier, and it was talking about the ramping up production because uh, we had just got done picking uh, two barrels of Buffalo Trace and Susanna is a fantastic tour guide there. And they great. just got they just got done doing their uh, their shutdown for renovations. And now they're doing 1200 barrels per day. Right. Wow. So lots of production. However, when we think about Blanton's, what does Blanton's do? It comes from one warehouse, right? Warehouse H, as as Chris and Matt Cusick said on the chat earlier, did they get a renovation? Like, is it getting bigger? No, it's <laughs> it's holding the same amount of barrels that it's always held. So, like, there's still this like this question that says like, how are you able to keep pumping out more product to be able to do that? And I'll I'll throw a question to you all as well as as this becomes more popular, will we see quality suffer? Because remember, this is a non H dated product, right? So nothing saying that they have to put something that's a four or six, eight year, whatever it is on it. Well, do you think quality could suffer in the long term? So just to point out the why it's not age dated, we do get that dump date, right? So we will at least be able to see if it starts getting younger and younger. Um, well, but no, you don't know. What, you, don't know, know yeah. Yeah. you don't All know. You know, it's dumped. Dump. Yeah, 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 that's dumped. My bad. Yeah. 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 I can put Get a out of here, Jordan. <laughs> Mute him, Kenny. Hey, let me know if you want to dump that. I'll put a dump in a box and send it to you. Oh. Is that a corona dump? I don't want that. Hey. <laughs> so I'm probably going to be the outlier here, but I've never been one who's really been that frantic over Blanton's. It's never scored that highly for me, and it's always done poorly in blind tastings. Uh, I think one year at San Francisco, I didn't even meddle it. I don't remember what year that was, or I'd tell you, but uh, it, it, it's not been something that has always gravitated toward my palate. So uh, I can't, I can't see the the quality go, going down. I think if you like Blanton's, that 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 style is, is going to be there. I personally am buying Buffalo Trace uh, regular every day of the week over Blanton's. Matt Cusick yeah. also had something kind of funny to say, like. Does it have to actually be aged in warehouse age or just be finished in warehouse age? Because maybe they just like roll it through the middle of it and they're like, hey, it was in warehouse age for like 20 seconds. So, well, I mean, that, you know, that warehouse, uh, it it probably holds what? It's probably not a 20,000 barrel warehouse, but it's probably 10, it's you, you know, big. 10 or 15. It's, it's a big warehouse. So I'm guessing, you know, b before a lot of those barrels were going to Buffalo Trace or wherever it was. Um, and now they may just say, all right, every barrel that's in here is going to be a Blanton's bottle now. Um, but on the quality, you know, I don't see the quality really dropping. Um, I, I doubt they'll really mess with the age. You know, it'll stick around that six year age range for a long time. And I don't I don't see them really changing that up because at the end of the day, I think it would hurt them more for people to have bad Blantons than it would for them to, you know, sell a little more. 
I, I, that's I, I not what's you, really pushing the business for them. I, I agree with you, but I bet you we could look at it even 2013 or 2014 Blantons and taste it blind with a current Blantons, and you're going to have a better Blantons in 2013 or 2014. Ooh, I don't. I mean, well, that sounds like a challenge. So, uh, <laughs> is this in your head though? I mean, we've been it's saying totally about in my the, head. Yeah, we've yeah. been saying about this kind of stuff forever, right? We'd be like, oh, all the new stuff can't compete with the new old stuff, but. But I'm not even saying old stuff. I'm saying, you know, not not we too terribly long ago. ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like seven years ago now, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, Blake, you got some of those Bourboner 2015s stashed away? There we I go. We, we, can, we can do a blind sample on that. We don't have to sample. You can just send a bottle to each of us and then we'll go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You got enough. It's it's bottle time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, cause I've heard from some of the, like the older blends from the nineties and stuff were actually like 10, 12 year old barrels that, that were being bottled. But so that's a completely different bourbon than like the six year, but who knows it, it'd be a fun experiment. Yeah. So I'm, I'm that's a, that's a really good question to, to kind of, you know, go into the, towards we get to the end of this, because, you know, uh, Jordan, I kind of lean on you here because yep. uh, within a uh, Breaking Bourbon article recently, you all had talked about Blanton's Gold and sort of like what it meant. And, you know, you you kind of talked about, you know, the hype and hysteria of, you know, basically like oh, chasing after the shiny new red ball and then ultimately just being disappointed at the end of the day because you're not going to get your hands on it. Right. And so you had, you had put at the end of the article, like people are curious about what's new, but that excitement can be quickly overtaken with resentment. It's unknown how sustainable this practice will be for the company. However, there's other plenty of non-bourbon companies that find great success with this strategy. Yep. I was kind of curious, like, you know, what other kind of companies like have a had a have a strategy like this? And, you know, and do you think that this is also always going to work with bourbon even in the future? Yeah. So I think right two part question here. So I think it's true, right? We also we often post these press releases or we'll post these articles and we'll talk about, and often it's around Buffalo Trace, around a new product or a limited edition, just something that people know is going to be really hard to get. We have so many readers reach out on a daily basis saying, where can I just find a bottle of Buffalo Trace, let alone any of their other products, right? So we put out the Blends Gold press release and instantly we started being um, just just inundated with people just reaching out saying, great, another Buffalo Trace product I'm never going to see, right? And we were like, well, that's interesting. This mm-hmm. isn't having to hit the shelf yet, and people are already pissed about that. First, you look at other, and I'm going to put Blanton's Gold now in a quote-unquote premium product range, right? Maybe not the Pappy Van Winkle range, but premium product range. You look at other products, right? We'll say high-end watches, high-end cars, whatever, where there's a limited amount, right? And people are still fascinated by them, knowing that they're not going to be able to get one, Right, but they're still super fascinated. They're not pissed at the car brand. They're not pissed at Ford that they're not going to be able to buy the new Ford GT because it's so out of the price range. You know why? Because they can still go out and buy another Ford product. A lot of people with Buffalo Trace, using that analogy, they see, hey, I can't get Blanton's Gold, but guess what? I can't get any other Buffalo Trace product either. So what does it even matter? They right? get so Fireball. They <laughs> buy a Fireball. They or... get a Fireball, and, and after a Fireball <laughs> screwball face off, I'm not sure if they want yeah. either. But, um, <laughs> But, you know, it's one of those things where I think people are getting a little ticked that, yeah, all these products keep coming out, especially from Buffalo Trace. But you know what? We can't get anything they put out anyway. So what's the point? Right. It's like them getting salt rubbed into wounds. Um, and I think consumers are getting really irked about this. So we'll we'll see if this keeps up. But with more, you know, as Fred pointed out, more and more Buffalo Trace products are going to be hitting the market in years to come. Kind of go back to that. You got to release something new every year. And um People are just going to either keep getting really pissed and either start shunning the brand or, or we'll see what happens, but it's going to be a really interesting experiment. That's for sure. You know, Jordan, you bring, you brought up something like that. Those were the kinds of letters that we would get at Whiskey Advocate like nine and 10 years ago. And, you know, it led to them changing a lot of things, um, you know, because people were so upset. Yeah. Like you, you even go to uh, straightbourbon.com 2006 to 2011 archives and you'll read a lot of people just being angry that they can't get stuff you know the one thing that is a constant in this and any kind of like uh any any anything that i could ever offer you as a device would be to not get frustrated with that don't stop doing what you're doing you guys are doing a great job with that with, with your with your reporting but the the anger people it just it never ends you start happy 
you you uh you get pissed off when you become a bourbon fan and then eventually you 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 accept it and you just find yourself sitting on the couch and drinking maker's mark again you know <laughs> <laughs> it's a cycle of be being a bourbon fan there's no way around it i'm i'm loving the comments that are com that are finding the ford brands and naming each uh sazerac brand for what Ford <laughs> brand it is. Stag Jr. is the F-150 Raptor. That That's sort of right. Thing. <laughs> exactly. So I also kind of want to uh, just kind of touch on the price point a little bit too, because $120, it's steep, right? Okay. That's 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 even cr over super premium of whatever that, that threshold was a while ago. Maybe, that, maybe that's just the new premium. I remember uh, the Blanton's Gold that I purchased overseas, even after shipping, getting it back home, it equated about seventy to eighty dollars per bottle, right? Mm. So I look at this and I'm thinking, well, I think you can actually still get this cheaper in like Saint Martin and some of the other islands and other areas that are around. So, do you look at this as? And I've always been a big fan of of Sazerac of what they do of not gouging or pricing out of the market because Pappy Twenty Three they could they could sell a thousand dollar bottle to the distributor they can do it and it'll sell and it's not a problem but they don't do it right and i think they do it on principle and they do it because they look at the long game however this is like one of the first times that they've come out and they are pricing it essentially where secondary was yep. when it was around mm -hmm. so i'm going to jump in and then a lot of others take over but because i've been sitting on this comment for a while so i reviewed blanton's gold back in 2015 right and i had bought in a bottle from overseas and i think I don't know, MSRP was around 80, 85 in total, right? Don't get me wrong, Blanton's Gold is actually my favorite Blanton's bottle out of the out of the lineup, right? Green, regular, straight from the barrel. I actually prefer Blanton's Gold. But even back then, at $85 or a bottle, I said I really would pause and think about spending the money on this versus just getting, you know, a bottle or two of regular Blanton's because I think, you know, the price to value in terms of taste just isn't quite there. And now when you jack it up to over $100, I mean, folks, you know, Blanton's, if you can, if you have a choice between the two, regular Blanton's all the way, just because it's going to be cheaper and you're going to get close enough, right? And if you can't, I still say there's a lot of really great bourbons out there for under 50 bucks that sure, it's not going to be the Blanton's name, not going to be the bottle, not going to be the shiny gold stopper, or you're going to get something that tastes really fantastic. Amen. So I would, I would have people pause and think about that before they drop the money. Anybody else have a comment or you just... I, I didn't mean I'm to shut that down. I, just... I, I endorse Jordan's comments fully. I, I think part of the problem is now these days, most people are probably paying close to that three figure mark for regular Blanton's, which is, and that's just when they can find it. So it's kind of like, you know, you have to confront reality as reality and not how we want it to be. So I, I don't know. Would I pay $135? Well, maybe I would, but, but <laughs> don't hit yourself. I, We've all got I problems. It, I'd, yeah. I'd grab it, but yeah, I know. I'm, uh, but I don't think that's a good deal. I'm like, I'm with Jordan, like $135 for that bourbon. You throw it in a blind tasting and you're it, blind tasting of 10 bourbons, and it's probably going to come in probably that, you know, six, five to yeah. six range. Five, six. Yeah. So, so this is what this is what I want. So if someone is listening to this show and you're an economist, I want you to study the price points of new releases of the past five years from craft distilleries, from uh, blue blood distillers, and compare the new pricing to their old pricing and their and their traditional items. It's all over the damn place. <laughs> there, there's no rhyme or reason. No. To it. <laughs> I mean, I could yeah. I could find a so-called craft whiskey that was aged in Abraham Lincoln's favorite tree for fifteen hundred dollars, <laughs> uh, or I could get a, a bourbon that's actually, you know, when it came out, a rye that was actually really good when it came out, but got shit on heavily for its price point and peerless, a three-year-old rye which was actually really good, was ninety-nine dollars, and people lost their shit. Uh, and then, you know, and then Elijah Craig Rye comes out uh, it, it, and it's 30 bucks and an old Forrester Rye comes out and it's 23. And it's like, it's all over the place. <laughs> I don't I, I don't know how they're pricing this stuff. Are they just throwing darts? I mean, how are they figuring this shit out? I, I think it's all about what, you know, what categories they want to be in. They want to have certain ones for 
every occasion, you know, a, a lot of them are getting smart and they say, all right, we see some openings in the daily drinker categories. Let's put some more 20, you know, 20, $25 bottles out there and really take advantage of the people who are tired of seeing every bottle that's, you know, a hundred dollars or more. Um, well, and, and Blake, is it the big guys being able to do that? You know, to, oh, to, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's, it's much harder for I, I'm, I'm not saying that the smaller guys can't because you look at somebody like a Chattanooga who's been able to you know, keep the price pretty reasonable. You, their two products are thirty five dollars and forty five dollars around that range. Um, but overall, yeah, I mean, Old Forester and the big guys really have um, a huge advantage here. And kind of I, I think it's Jordan's point about Buffalo Trace. I'm surprised they haven't come out with a new product line. And maybe that's what the benchmark, the idea of benchmark was, was to have that, that lower priced, hopefully readily available product that's out there whenever people say, well, I can't get blends, but at least benchmark's still here. So, yeah. you, you know, they want to hit every mark in the market if they can. It used to be that they would decide what their price point was by going into the liquor store and seeing which bottle was selling uh, and what they wanted to be next to. And that, that's how they used to do it. And I don't feel like they do that anymore. I, I just, I just think they kind of, they have, I think they might have too many like MBAs in a room crowding <laughs> over a table and they don't have really any, they're just looking at like, Oh, Hey, who's going to buy it? Oh, bro dude in wall street's going to buy it. So 120. <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah. know. I don't know how they're priced. At. It's crazy. There's a there's a comma in a spreadsheet somewhere that somebody just messed up and it's just like ah we'll let it roll, <laughs> which I guarantee you in Blan or in the uh, Blanton's Gold meetings there was somebody who was saying nope push the price to two hundred dollars and they then you had somebody else who was like nah let's let's be more reasonable and do one hundred and thirty you, you know it's they know what they have and so would it have sold out just as well at two hundred I think there's I think yes but. I don't know. We're, we're all crazy for buying all these bourbons anyways. <laughs> I mean, Kenny, what, what do you like? Yeah. You know, you're hosting. What do, what do you think about this? Like 130 bucks. Mm -hmm. Would you buy it? Would you not? What would you do? Would you recommend somebody buy it for that price? Yeah, and not like, like show aside from everything, just as a consumer, would you yeah. buy a $130 bottle of Blanton's? I think it goes back into whatever people do. You, you always, you always try to get your first bottle, right? Mm -hmm. Try it. That's great. And we, we talk about this all the time of when you're doing tastings and everything like that. Get a few people together. If you find it, split it, whatever, try it, do it. However, I don't see this as something that actually I take that back because people are going to go crazy and they're going to go buy it up anyway. For me personally, it's not going to be that. You know, I, I've been fortunate to be in bourbon long enough like you all to know that I was able to buy this overseas for a much cheaper price a long time ago. So I've, I'm okay with it. Um, is it my favorite bourbon? No. Uh, do I like straight from the barrel a lot more? I do. Yeah. Sorry, Jordan. Yeah. I do. Like I'm a huge big yeah, I'm a, have a personal taste preference. No worries. Yeah. And so and so I'm a. I would say like I would lean towards that way. And I'd say you know what, save your 120 bucks. Go and try and figure out like if you've got a relative that's on a cruise ship after this whole Corona thing flies over and say don't go on cruises, everybody don't yeah. go on cruises. Well. Not right now, you know, whether it's there or whether you're going to uh, the Netherlands or whether you're going somewhere overseas and you say like, just wait out for that bottle of straight from the barrel. That's personally what I would do, uh, because that's, that's where I think, uh, if you're going to spend 120 bucks on a bottle, because retail, even over there, that's about what you're going to pay is 120 bucks a bottle. And you're going to get, uh, you know, at the same exact price. Like I said, for me, I, I think the price point's high. Um, it really is. And I think that you know, a lot of people even said in the chat, it's like you're paying 120 bucks for a six year product. That's pretty expensive, right? Yep. Yep. I actually don't think it's high for the product. I mean, because uh, as pointed out in the chat uh, by numerous people, supply and demand, the supply, the demand for this is off the chart. So my whole commentary about the $120, I, I just kind of want rationale behind it. And, you know, just the, I know the market will bear that. I'm just speaking in general from the bourbon industry. I just don't feel like anyone really has a uh, has much of a, a blue book on how to price right now. But Bland's is not going to have any problem selling. I no. mean, it's nope. agreed. There's, there's going to be lines. They could charge what they want. Going to be allocated. Yeah. We're going to be miserable. 
Welcome those to the who know will, will buy four roses and wild turkey and other things. Hey, have, I had a four roses the other day that just tasted flat out off to me. It was a single off. barrel. Yeah, it was mm. a single barrel. It was just off. Somebody's private selection. Uh, yeah, store pick or just a regular? <sighs> no, it was a regular. It was a regular really? one. And I tasted it the mm. next day to make sure it wasn't my palate that day. And it just, huh. it, it was weird. Huh. Hey, Fred, I don't know if you've been around this long enough, but did you know that you could have two barrels side by side? And they taste different. <laughs> this is true. But very rarely, I have never had an off product from Four Roses. Uh, never. That was the first time. Yeah. I'm Except for cool. actually from the 90s, I had some off products. Who was it? Was it Elmer T. Lee who had like the spoiled batch that uh it was in 2015? Yeah. Yeah. 2015, yeah. the the wet cardboard batch. The yeah. cork, cork taint. Cork, cork taint. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and don't don't forget uh, Jim Rutledge's uh, mutated yeast batch that That's went to right. Germany, the White mm -hmm. Whale. That's mm -hmm. right, absolutely. So I'm going to finish this up with one last question about Blanton's, and this is now that we have seen Blanton's gold come on, it's it's making waves. Will we ever see? And we had mentioned already, straight from the barrel, ever hit the U.S. Yes, 100%. it's got to be. It's got to be a B tech. I mean, it will. They, they I, I, have I don't to think know. they'll mess with that. I don't think they'll mess with the antique collection. But I would say yes. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to go back to that comment and theory we were talking about. They're going to need a new product, right? Not in 2020, but 2021, 2022, 23, whatever. They need a new product every year, or two new products every year. And straight from the barrel is an easy one to slide in there. And based on the barrel that I have in my truck, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We are all headed to Norton Commons. I'm right kidding. Now. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say, especially if these tariffs stick around to just kind of add on to what Jordan was saying. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be able to, and oh, it, it hurts me to say this because I've heard people for so long say, all right, I love tariffs, like more bourbon in the USA. And I'm like, no, like, no, that's, that's not how like not international works. trade works. Like no. we need commerce. Like we need all this. Like we have to grow bourbon category as a whole. However, if this is what's going to happen and it's like, okay, well they could, they could basically sell it here in the USA for, and they would get more money out of it for the same price that they're going to have to sell with tariffs and everything else overseas. Hell yeah. Like might as well keep it here. Right. So I could definitely see the argument that we will see it here uh, in a few years. I realize if we do, if gold's going for one thirty, you realize straight from the barrel is going to be a, Pricey product. That's oh, a two hundred dollar yeah. product. Yeah, it's two fifty. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want just Don't everybody get, get one. Everybody get one last mm hmm in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic way to close out the show everybody so i want to say thank you again for coming on i i think we we hit on a lot of stuff um so as usual we, we didn't do it on the podcast at the very beginning uh i want everybody to kind of give a their outro so brian i'll let you go first yeah uh thanks for having me on again uh late addition to it because i this damn uh coronavirus didn't let me do my tasting tonight with some clients happy to be here uh, the only thing I want to add, other than the normal find me at sippingcorn.com, bourbonjustice.com, is Obi Toppin would have been the number one uh, player of the year. Uh, they would have beat Kansas in the <laughs> in the final four if it had happened. Um, that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, wish it would have been there. Uh, thanks, guys. Absolutely. Jordan. Sure, next, this, is, this is Jordan, one of the three guys from breakingbourbon.com. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Breaking Bourbon and make sure to go to the website for a daily basis as we do update the upcoming release calendar um, quite often. Well, Blake, it kind of yeah, yeah. just kind of narrows down from there. So right? I've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking double time for myself and for Aaron, I'm taking his outro as well. So <laughs> if you, you want know, to go for it, I messaged him, said, apologize, it, was having computer issues. So I don't know if. I said, internet, it gets us all. It, it gets us all, but no worries. But, <laughs> like, I know that all too well. I, I, yeah, I'm, I said, I'm just glad I can, you know, put the heat on somebody else for once on the air. <laughs> but uh, no, so I'm Blake from bourboner.com. Uh, you know, always fun to be here. And I, I thought this was a great show, a lot of good information. So hopefully we all got to sit around and enjoy and some bourbon and, you know, talk about the craziness and avoid hearing the corona virus for a little while so enjoyed it as always guys thanks for having me
Absolutely. And that's the kind of what I wanted to do tonight was to hopefully take everybody's mind a little bit off of it, right? And, and talking about Blanton's was something that I think was easy to do. There's been a lot of news about it recently. And I think over the past year and even two years, we've seen this just go berserk in the market. And we've just seen a lot of people really chase after it. And maybe this is also one of those brands that is also helping fuel the growth of bourbon overall, because it is a pretty bottle and people will look at it and they get behind it. It's, it's in TV shows. So, you know, it, it's a, it's something I, I, I think took long enough that we actually dedicated a show to actually talk about it because it is a, it is a force to be reckoned with. And it is a catalyst with inside of this industry that does move bourbon in a, in a forward direction. So Fred, you want to give an outro? Because I think you've got a few different places that you, you know, you podcast, you got a magazine or something too. Something uh, to <laughs> yeah. And also in this episode of the podcast, uh, in my above the char, I said I was going to San Francisco. I am not. Um, I ended up not going due to the coronavirus. That said, you can find me on uh, in the podcast world. Just I interview musicians and drink whiskey with them. Uh, I've got some uh, fun names coming up. Uh, i got David Byrne from the Talking Heads and uh, Clown from Slipknot coming up. Uh, so make sure you're tuning into that. Just, just like you search for bourbon pursuit, just search for Fred Minnick show. And then got a magazine bourbon plus, oh man, next issue. We've got, uh, Jackie Zykin on the cover and she, she reveals a lot, uh, about her life and, uh, how she saved, uh, the old forest to rye from being one of those highly priced products. So if you want to learn a little bit about the the pricing strategies of Brown Foreman, at least Jackie Zykin's a big part of that. So make sure you're subscribing to that. Go to bourbonplus.com and, you know, just social media, everything else, just my name, Fred. All right, Fred. Appreciate it, man. And thank you all for for joining in. Thank you, everybody that was in the chat as well. A lot of great comments, a lot of great questions that that came in that really helped fuel this conversation. Make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit on all the social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Definitely. We're still there. <laughs> Jordan, you you laugh. People I love the TikTok. Hey, Jordan laughs. Guess what? Breaking Bourbon signed up for TikTok. Hey, they Breaking Bourbon's been on TikTok for a long time. We just, we just were incognito until you found oh, out. Oh, see? See? <laughs> it's, it's starting I, to happen. I still haven't signed up, but I'm going to. See? It's there. Don't, don't miss the train. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. And we'll see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.